Okay, thank you very much indeed. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this meeting of the River Hamble Harbour Management Committee, which again, uh, due to coronavirus precautions, we're holding online these meetings for the foreseeable future. So I will move straight to the agenda. And the first item on the agenda is apologies for absence. And we have apologies from Trevor Bryant and also from uh, let's have a look. Councillor Dominic Hiscock is attending in place of Rupert Curl. So we have apologies from Rupert Curl as well. So that was, those are the apologies. Now I'm just uh, also got a note. I'm just trying to see whether he's with us. Yes, I can see Stephen Masters has joined us. So I'm really pleased as well to be able to welcome our new co-op team, it's Captain Stephen Masters, who is representing ABP, and he has replaced your recall, Captain Phil Buckley. Yes, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, delighted to join you. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, now I can see a hand up already. Trevor, guest. Trevor, did you want to say something? Uh, yes, um, I am present. Uh, you are here uh, after all. Present, yes, I, so can, I, am here. I, stop, I can see that now, although I'd read, given your apology, so welcome. Good to see Thank you. Thank you. Right, okay, so let me just sort out this uh, little bit of technology. So I've got the agenda in front of me. Here we go. Right, okay, so declarations of interest. Now, we do have a number of standing declarations. So I will ask the question first before moving on to any new interest, if anybody wishes to change the interests with which they are familiar and always declare, please raise your hand electronically now and I will come to you. I don't see any. Okay, does anybody have any new interest they wish to declare? And for uh, new members, um, looking at uh, Stephen here as well, uh, is there anything you wish to declare? These are either personal interests, uh, in which case you are able to both talk about the um, the item and you know, so speak and vote, or what are called disclosable pecuniary interests. So I don't know if these have been explained to you, but basically that is something that would require your departure from a meeting while that item was being discussed. So is anyone anything anyone wishes to declare? Uh, nothing at this stage. Okay, all right, thank you. Right, let's just check what the messages are saying. Okay, that's all right. Right, so we now move to the minutes of the previous meeting, and these were circulated and they're with the agenda. This was the meeting held virtually on the 11th of September, and I need to have those accepted as a correct record, so perhaps I can ask by exception if anybody has an issue with that. Please raise a hand and we'll hear what that issue is. Okay, well, if not, then I will take it unless somebody signifies otherwise that we're agreeing the minutes is a correct record. Okay, that's done. Item four is deputations. Uh, we don't have any deputations for this meeting. Item five is chairman's announcements. I don't have any initial uh, additional announcements to make. So we'll move to item six which is the Marine Director and Harbour Master's report and current issues. And there is also an addendum uh, to the agenda, which, which has been circulated with the papers as well, which also forms a part of this report. So I'll pass over to Jason now to introduce his report. And thank you, Chairman, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, a few items uh, to um, append to draw your attention to. They relate really to the key business of the Harbour Authority, which is uh, navigational safety. Um, on the 18th of uh, October, we had November, I should say, we had our uh, routine um, six monthly uh, inspection by the designated person of the Marine Safety Management Service uh, system. This um, uh, system uh, is analysed by the designated person uh, in deeper extent, to a deeper extent than normal at this time of the year because um, of the deadline set by the regulator for the 31st of March next year. And that's the important date uh, for members to recognize. That's the date that, that the regulator requires um, a certification of compliance 
um, to be sent to it in Southampton. Um, the duty holders uh, uh, guarantee that that uh, marine safety management system is fit for purpose was provided by the designated person in a letter which is contained in the annex um, on his inspection on the 18th of November. So that will allow me to um, uh, uh, advise Councillor Evans uh, to write to the duty holder in the first week in January. Uh, and I will be uh, appending a draft letter for his signature at the board meeting. The next uh, item is, uh, again, it's part of our routine system. We are a Category C lighthouse authority uh, for Trinity House, and that means that we have to have 97.5% availability. Uh, and uh, we have two inspections every year by Trinity House. The first of those is a physical inspection of our 164 aids to navigation around the river and that was conducted in March. A report has already been submitted but this latest inspection at the end of October uh, was our paper audit uh, and our records were found to be in good order which means that we retain uh, as you would expect our status as a Cat C local lighthouse authority. Um, the final uh, item on my, um, on my list is uh, a note that I put in, given the level of interest in, in uh, Universal's uh, proposal. Um, I'd just like to say here that the live Harbour Works consent is being progressed in the usual manner, um, and it will come before the Management Committee and the Harbour Board at the next round of meetings to consider matters of navigational uh, safety and environmental compliance, and that is entirely usual. So uh, that's my report, and if there are any questions, I'll take them now. Sean, you're muted. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to say, if anybody has any questions or any comments they'd like to make on Jason's report, would they please raise their hands with the little uh, electric hand button on the bottom, which I hope you're all familiar with now. So any questions on that report? And I'm not seeing any. Good. Okay, Jason, I think that's... Uh, Oh, I do have one, Rupert. We'd like to have the floor. Uh, is there any comment about the letter sent round by Universal today, um, Hardmaster? Um, I, I don't have any comment on it. Uh, I mean, I think it, the um, the letter was um, sent to us slightly too late to be published in the documentation. So Democratic Services um, will have some comment, I dare say, on that. But on the, the substance within the letter, I think the Harbour Authority has never been clearer that it always considers every Harbour Works consent on its merits and is very clear on its requirement to assess uh, it, navigational safety and also environmental compliance. So um, to that end, uh, Alison uh, Fowler, our, our Environment Officer, is completing a Habitats uh, Regulations Assessment as part of the Harbour Works consent application and you'll see that uh, in the next round. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Rupert. Right, so if we move on down the agenda, which we're doing, that brings us to item seven, which is the environmental update. And I'd like to invite Alison Fowler to present that report. Good afternoon, everybody. Nice to see so many people here. Um, so I'm just going to run through the update from the autumn period. Um, the first recommendation relates to the final point on the report, so um, we'll take that um, at the end when we discuss that point. Um, just briefly um, to summarise, the Port Waste Management Plan, our requirement under merchant shipping regulations, uh, was required this year. So um, I did the update um, discussing with all marinas and yards about the provision of facilities within the harbour to ensure that no vessel that goes to sea overnight ever has the need to deposit waste at sea because the harbour doesn't provide sufficient facilities um, and that was uh, approved by the MCA uh, recently. Quick update on our seawall repair um, around the harbour office itself um, which is is in need of repair that the planning um, permission for that has been granted now um, and we're expecting the marine licence from the MMO to come through in the next few weeks. 
Um, it's a maintenance consent in terms of, of harbour consent, so it won't come before the committee and the board, as I think I've previously mentioned, um, and um, the Environment Agency applications underway as well. Uh, the third item, um, fairly self-explanatory, I thought I'd include a photo just to, to give a visual of, of what these verticals look like. Um, we're really pleased that this um, this project um, being covered across the English and French coast will actually come to, is, is present now within the handle, uh, to see how we can improve biodiversity net gain on fairly barren features such as seawalls, um, really important particularly with the legislation pending uh, regarding the change that's going to be required that developers will have to produce uh, biodiversity net games as part of development. So to be able to see something um, in place on the handle and to be able to have the Bournemouth University doing research on that is really valuable. Um, item six, um, self-explanatory um, action is, is underway with authorities on, on that one. Um, and uh, same item seven, that's a, a usual round of meetings and requirements that we go through and um, the water quality and boating workshop, really just an update on that. There's huge engagement on that from around the Solent, which is really positive to see. Jason Hubmaster here is chairing the um, chaired the workshop and there's really positive, um, positive response from everybody, um, strong engagement to try and improve um, not only the facilities for disposal um, of black water from vessels um, around the Solent, but also that sort of um, behavioural change, cultural change element, which is um, which can be a challenging um, thing to address. But people are working hard to try and see if we can improve um, improve the best practice and um, reduce any nutrient inputs into the Solent that we can. And of course, this is one, albeit minor one, but it is still still an input. So many people working hard on that. And uh, from our part at the Harbour Authority specifically, um, work still underway with regard to replacing our own pump out, um, and that's progressing. The final item on the report um, is the one um, which links to the recommendation. Um, so the members will remember um, a while ago I updated that the M27 motorway bridge, um, and for those that are the new, new to the committee, um, the M27 bridge has direct drainage, so pipes that come down from the bridge directly into the water, um, as well as the drainage that comes from um, the catchment either side, comes into the river. And for a long time, many, many years, um, many of you will remember, we've been campaigning to try and get that addressed um, with highways. And we were delighted to be told um, uh, in 2019 that it would be addressed as part of the smart motorway scheme currently underway. Um, unfortunately, uh, when it actually came to it, the contractor um, the smart motorway contractor who was um, required to do the work, the estimate came in, think about three times as much as Highways England had successfully bid for, um, for the funds. So um, disappointingly, we've been told that it won't be delivered as part of the smart motorway scheme, but they were um, very, very strong to stress that they there's still a strong desire to deliver this um, and they want to work with the Harbour Authority um, continuing that dialogue and the um, with us continuing the input that we have done to date to um, help with their bids for funding in the next rounds, which are pending, and there from thereafter um, support um, them with technical information, local information, and in taking that forward. Um, so that is um, was disappointing. Um, I'm I'm hopeful that you know we will continue to work with them um, provide the assistance that they need to support them but i think um linking to the recommendation we would um we would call on those that can support us in doing that to do so okay thank you very much indeed alison uh, lots of interest while you've been giving your short address uh, so i'm going to move to members now who want to ask questions. So far I've got uh, councillors Quantrill and Pearson and Cooper and Cartwright. So Lance first, please. Uh, thank you, Alison. On item six, the unpermitted developments, what do you expect the outcome to be from the action which are currently being taken, please? Um, so there are various options and with, with the different authorities involved, the different options depend on um, the, the the elements that they are responsible for. So, for example, um, one on the salt marsh will be uh, 
Natural England's call will be key with regards to damage to any site if damage has actually been done. If it has not been done, is it more damaging to then rectify the situation? Mm -hmm. Um, so that's the sort of approach with regards to planning authorities. Um, it will be um, the case of whether it's um, breached the planning policy um, or whether an application for planning might then be invited. So, um, but as I said, these things have been reported and, and we're in discussion with those authorities at the moment. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And Frank? Uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, Alison, uh, two points, if I may. You've picked up, partly picked up one of the issues that I wanted to raise, and that's about the nitrate and phosphate um, pollution in the, in the river. And Natural England quite clearly is concerned about that, as indeed are we all. Now, <clears throat> when you took us uh, on a river trip a couple of years back now, uh, one of the features you raised was about algae bloom on the mudflats. Um, so, and this links back down to the um, nitrates. Are you monitoring the the amount of nitrate in the river? And if you are, is there any improvement? Has there been any improvement over the last couple of years since Natural England <coughs> raised the profile of the, the concern, shall we say, of this? Um, it is particularly important when one uh, reads about this explosion at this um, sewage works that was uh, the other day. And the <clears throat> second question basically is about the, I noticed at the end of um, paragraph nine, you referred to the help from MPs. Are they driving things forward? And is this related to the Environment Act? Sorry, Bill. Is the act, it's only on the second committee stage. Thank you. Um, so related to the first point on nitrates, um, no, we do not monitor it. Obviously, we have our, our observations um, and we can see patterns, but we don't monitor it. The Environment Agency do monitor it um, on an annual basis, um, and uh, that's that's done formally. In terms of seeing changes, um, you, you do get a lag. Um, there have been a, a huge amount of improvements done. Um, for example, changes to the discharge consent from sewage treatment work, the amount of nitrates they're allowed to put in, uh, that sort of thing, you do you do see a tend to see a lag. So improvements made in the last few years will start to make differences in time. But equally, you've got a groundwater issue. So nitrates locked up in groundwater take many, you know, take, take many years to to come through. So it, it is a huge, a huge topic, a lot of issues, but um uh, we we support where we can um, in the actions that we can take, and obviously providing information to other authorities that may help. And 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 the MPs. MPs as well. Yes. Um, so the second point regarding uh, the MPs, um, the MPs have been involved in this for probably um, fifteen plus years, certainly before my time here, and um, uh, we feel that that support, um, particularly when it comes to to um, highways, um, England and the correspondence at a senior level that um, that can uh, assist. Okay. okay, thanks very much, Alison. Uh, Mark, next. Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, item nine again, I'm afraid. Um, I've been on the uh, Harbour Authority since 2005, and, and it's been an issue all the way through uh, that time. Um, I note from the report, though, you mentioned that um, there is uh, some funding already secured. Uh, which obviously now won't be spent, um, I assume. So what's happening with that funding? Is it going to be earmarked uh, for the drainage or can we use it for some sort of interim mitigation? Uh, it strikes me that you know, it'll be a long, long time before any big projects come along again, you know, such as Smart Motorway, and there'll be a long, a long wait for the drainage to be done unless we do something in the interim. Any thoughts on that, please? Yeah, so I, I asked the same question um, of Highways England regarding that, that secured funding, and it has been re-released back into that pot of environmental improvements. Um, so there are many projects that bid for it and allocate. Um, they effectively handed it back. It's been allocated elsewhere. So it's a case of starting a new round of funding. But they are hopeful, given that um, it was successful and supported last time, that they will be successful in, in their next rounds. OK, I hope we can bang a few tables sometime. We need to. OK, uh, Trevor next. Trevor Cartwright. 
Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I too was going to ask on the N27 about the funding, so you've answered that question. But uh, I seem to go back even longer, like 20 years on this committee, and we've been banging on about this. Um, ex councillor Pepper, we've been banging on even longer than that, I think, actually. And it just strikes me this is an appalling situation to be in it again. Um, you know, I know our, my local authority, we have to jump through all sorts of hoops to obey the rules, etc., etc. This just seems to sort of go on forever. And I don't hold, a, hold out a lot of hope of our MPs been going on about it for the last 15 years as to what they're actually going to achieve as well. But I just really think this is this is a mess and shouldn't continue. OK, I think that's noted. Uh, John Selby next. You need to unmute yourself, John. You're still muted. There you go. Still muted. There you go. Oh, that's better, thank you. Yeah, I'm bitterly disappointed the work is not going ahead on the river bridge. Um, it must be very nearly 30 years since Councillor Rice first raised this issue. We were passed from authority to authority. No one wished to take responsibility until in the end the highways agency did. And now we've been let down again. And I feel nobody will ever do anything until we've actually had an environmental disaster. And I just wonder where else we can bring pressure to bear. Thank you. OK, thank, thank you very much for that, John. I think in, in reality, the pressure is being brought to bear in the right place, but maybe not enough pressure, arguably. And the recommendation, as you can see, is that we get the chairman of the Harbour Board to write to Highways England, obviously strongly, and to our local members of parliament, Eastley, Fareham and Mian Valley. Maybe we should beef that up a bit. Uh, just, it sounds perhaps a little bit passive, given members' views. You know, the chairman of the Harbour Board writes in the strongest terms to Highways England and strongly urges our members of parliament uh, to support bringing about these essential environmental improvements to the M37 drainage, something like that, if members would like to see that strengthened. I'm not uh, hearing any dissent from that view. Uh, I think it's an excellent idea, Mr Chairman. Uh, I think something does need to be said. Um, it can't just be left. OK, well, I'm seeing a few thumbs up as well. So I think that is our recommendation, which I hope Emma has captured. So unless anybody wants to stick their hands up and say, I don't, I object. So does anyone object? No, we're all in favour. If you want to all stick all your hands up, do. But uh, hopefully that's agreed. OK, I'll take it that it is. Thank you. A few arms waving around there. So that amended recommendation is now agreed and we'll also note and support the remainder of the report. So we now move to item eight, which is the forecast uh, budget outturn for the River Hamble and the forward budget. And we have Jenny Wadham with us today, who was able to present that report, I'm sure. Thank you, Chair. Afternoon, everybody. So yes, if I start with the, the forecast outturn for the current financial year, um, we're actually projecting a, a £90,000 surplus on revenue activity, um, which is £3,000 higher than budgeted. So, so good news story for this year. That will allow us to make the, the £35,000 contribution to the asset replacement reserve in full um, and also make a, a transfer to the revenue reserve of £55,000 even to, to replenish the balance there. Um, so we're saying so far we're expecting fairly minimal impact as a result of COVID. So I think we mentioned at last time that there has been a, an impact on visitor income uh, being down at the first part of the year. Um, but with the hope that that would pick up by the end of the year, it had been picking up. And obviously that was just before we went into uh, to lockdown two, but it, it was looking more optimistic as we went through. Um, there are some, some st seasonal staff costs that we've had as a result of COVID as well, it, just in terms of the timing. Um, and when we would normally recruit our seasonal staff and when we first went into lockdown. COVID aside, so on the more business as, as usual side, um, there are some minor uh, forecast budget variances. So that includes things like the uh, the increased income as a result of the increase to the harbour dues that was recently agreed for the 2021 uh, calendar year. 
Um, the other thing to say about the current financial year, it's worth noting we've got no forecast spend from the Asset Enhancement Reserve now. And obviously, sadly, the Hamble Games had to be cancelled this year. Um, and also, there was originally planned to be some pontoon improvement work that have now been postponed. Um, if I move on to the, the forward budget for 21-22, which is in Appendix 2. Um, so again, we're providing for a, a surplus of £62,000, which would enable us to make the, the £35,000 contribution to the asset replacement reserve, um, and also a further £27,000 potentially that could be added to the, the revenue reserve, taking the balance in that reserve up to £82,000. Highlighting that nothing's been factored in for um, any potential financial impact of COVID in the next uh, financial year and obviously that's due to the uncertainty surrounding that but so just for members to be aware that could potentially affect the income and expenditure next year as well. So the proposed expenditure budget for 21-22 includes a, a £34,000 increase on the, the current uh, financial year budget, the majority of which is relating to staffing costs and that's to uh, cover things such as pay inflation, um, step progression within the existing pay scales um, and also bringing uh, overtime and allowances budgets more in line with the spend we've seen over the last few years. Obviously, since this report was prepared, we've heard it, all the, the various stories about the pay freeze for public sector workers, which will have some impact on that figure, if you like, that we shall uh, we should see in the, in the new year. Um, in terms of the income, oh, sorry, the uh, remaining increase in the uh, expenditure budgets, We've got £5,000 included for the, the biennial biometric survey um, and then also some smaller increases for the, the business rates that we know because of the, the withdrawal of the transitional relief um, and also there are some uh, costs there for the, the new harbour system, the, the uh, annual subscription cost that's based on this year's spend. The proposed income budget for next year is a, an increase of £9,000 on the current year budget. Um, and that's mainly to take into account the increase in harbour dues, so the 2% increase in harbour dues that was uh, agreed in September, um, I think it was. There's also obviously a small uh, inflationary increase for the Crown Estate uh, contract income. Um, and then we've just made a, a small reduction to the miscellaneous income budget. And again, that's based on the, the trends we've seen over the past years of actual miscellaneous income being received. The final thing that I just wanted to touch on briefly is the, the reserves. Um, and as mentioned, the, the revenue reserve is projected to increase by £55,000 by the end of March 21, um, actually rising to £82,000 by March 22. Um, worth saying that reserves policy allows maximum of 10% of gross expenditure, which would be £62,000. So potentially, um, if everything goes as planned in the budget, we could potentially be over that. Um, but given the uncertainties involved that the report is proposing, almost we, we wait to, to cross that bridge when we come to it, if you like. So we wait for the, the financial information to be a bit more certain and then um, informed decisions can be made on that. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions people may have. OK, thank you very much indeed for that, Jenny. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask of Jenny? Or any comments they would wish to make? See no hands. So I'll turn now to the recommendations, and there are recommendations at paragraphs two, three, four, and five. I'd like to confirm that they are agreed by the committee. Would anybody like to signify if they do not agree? Anybody wishing to abstain from agreeing? Then I will take it that it is agreed. So thank you for that. Thank you, Jenny. We now move on to item nine, which is the review of fees and charges. And uh, these, as you can see, relate to harbour dues for commercial vessels. And I will ask Jason if there's anything you'd like to say on this report. Thanks, Chairman. Um, the observant will note that the um, fees and charges for this year have uh, had the same 2% figure applied as we apply to harbour dues. I think it's a, a true reflection of the amount of work that goes into harbour works consents in the round um, and a true reflection on the, uh, the, the time that um, the teams spend on the water engaged in towing and moving vessels around um, and those figures are, are compatible with other um, 
authorities and do not undercut um, local commercial businesses, so they strike a, a good local balance. There's one um, small uh, addendum to this uh, that doesn't normally feature. Um, Jenny, in her last article, brought in uh, how we were doing financially with visitors' fees. Um, I mentioned at our last meeting that by the end of July we brought in £10,900 in terms of visitors' fees, whereas in a normal year we might have expected uh, to have brought in 18. We've not yet caught up with that. But what we have done is seen uh, income uh, greater than usual from uh, jet skis displaced from other slipways around the zone. And on, on a given day, we received well over a thousand pounds in terms of jet ski launches. Now, one of the reasons for that is that we are quite economical for that class of craft. And looking around at other harbours, uh, the rate for the launch of jet skis is considerably more than we have been charging. It is therefore correct uh, to uh, align that more accurately, more closely with the fees um, being charged elsewhere. And that is why you see uh, an increase in jet ski launch fees from five pounds to 10 pounds. Now it is a substantial increase in uh, percentage terms, but in outright terms, it is not great. Given the amount of uh, effort that educating new um, personal watercraft um, skippers to the Solent and what's required, particularly through our neighbours in Southampton Harbour, Master, uh, Harbour Masters area, where we brief them uh, in detail on, on what not to do in terms of approaching large craft. Um, that takes a considerable amount of effort and uh, is part of my own safety management system and also part of Southampton's system. Uh, and that extra effort also merits the increase uh, that I've shown. So that's the only difference, the £10 increase really in jet ski launching fees and a 2% increase across the board for other fees. Any questions? Uh, I'll take them now, please. Okay, thank you very much. And I see one questioner, Councillor Lance Quantrum. Lance. Thank you, Jason. Is there a maximum capacity that we have for personal watercraft? Because I read your report and it seems that many of them, um, despite the briefings which they may get on higher um, craft and their own personal craft, they still need attention from the harbour master patrols. It, it, it can, there's, a, there's a question in my mind that if we don't see people taking holidays abroad and we do see more and more people coming to the south coast, it's quite possible, as we've seen at Hailing Island, um, that certain resources such as car parking will be overwhelmed uh, and it crosses my mind that when it comes to personal watercraft being launched in the handball, whether there's a capacity on the water which we might see. I think the capacity on the water is, is not so much the issue. The, cap, the car parking capacity um, is always um, tight, particularly down at Warsash, where the majority launch from, um, whether or not jet skis arrive. The, the top of the slipway is, um, is more spacious than most. And there is a, a space there for jet ski trailers to be uh, rested while uh, jet ski skippers deploy to the water. Um, as members will know, we also have uh, something called an open port duty. So stopping people going on the water uh, is not something we can do if they're paying harbour dues. Uh, when one looks at the water, it sounds as if there are one could almost like a, a Cambridge punting um, event march across the can. It isn't like that. It, um, there are uh, groups who go out in, in, in small clumps um, where they occupy or stop in the main channel. We move them on and it's very manageable. Uh, it, is, it is not as grim as I think uh, uh, we might have got the impression. The, the, the key thing really was to work very closely with Southampton Harbour Master and uh, I'd like to thank his staff for coming together with us and putting together an acceptable briefing. Um, we do work with Hampshire Marine Police Unit to log in the jet ski side numbers of these vessels um, in order to um, record uh, transgressions. Um, such that if a jet ski finds itself in another harbour and, and transgresses, um, we've already got their name uh, and a record of what of how they've behaved in the past. So there's a lot of joint work going on here. 
um, that's that's uh, that's useful. I don't know whether um, Stephen Masters would wish to comment on how that works um, for him, or, or whether there's anything else we could do. But I'd be grateful to hear his thoughts. Hey. Would you like to jump ahead and say something? Yeah, um, just to really uh, echo Jason's thoughts there. That the um, the the work that's been going on between the two authorities, I think, um, has been really useful this last year. Uh, and probably before that, but uh, certainly in the last year, I know there's been a, a number of letters of um, warning letters issued to various jet ski owners. And that's really only been possible through the uh, registration of craft that um, Jason and his team have, 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 have taken down and, and been able to provide us with in following up and managing those uh, incidents on the water. Uh, so thank you very much for, for the, the assistance in that and hopefully that will continue in the future and, and working closely together. Um, we are in, in Southampton working on uh, issuing our first set of general directions um, which will hopefully be in place for next summer. Uh, one of those general directions will uh, implement um, uh, some speed restrictions for jet skis on, on Southampton water. Um, and uh, other craft as well, but uh, it will uh, will have an impact on, on jet skis uh, primarily. So s certainly, we're, we're, I think we're working in the same um, vein to try and improve water safety for users of uh, all craft, but um, uh, in managing that, uh, jet skis are and have been a particular problem uh, this summer with the increase uh, water use in, in the local area due to COVID-19. Uh, and I know the... Um, uh, Water Police uh, uh, have, have found a, a vast increase in, in the number of uh, incidents they are dealing with on, on the water as well. Okay, thank you very much indeed for that, Stephen. Uh, Councillor Mark Cooper next, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I just I wanted to comment on the uh, increase in the um, jet ski fee from five to ten pounds. Do I take it that that is now the same fee in nearby harbours? In other words, we've gone to, for the same figure because there were no comparative figures in the report that I could see. That's the first question. And the second question is, I've noticed on the water this, this summer especially, huge increase in paddle boarding, which must obviously cause some safety concerns for our own staff. Um, is that an issue that we need to be managing uh, better in, in, in the future? Okay, and the uh, first one, Jason, I think these are comparable charges, aren't they? There, there are, um, some harbours charge more, some are charging 15, others are charging around about 10, so we chose 10, that being a doubling effectively of the fee okay. we previously charged. With regard to paddleboarding, that's subject to a, a separate risk assessment. There are a number of commercial um, paddleboarding companies, as well as the private paddleboard users uh, around the river uh, that have, that have um, grown up. Uh, Universal Marina had a paddleboarding company that is now no longer in uh, Universal Marina. Uh, Premier Marinas have a, uh, a small paddleboarding commercial setup there. Um, there has from time to time been a, uh, a Chichester-based company called Fluid Kayaks, which face themselves occasionally uh, up at Swanwick. Um, working with the Swanwick outfit uh, within Premier Marina, um, to whom we would like to pay thanks, uh, the, the Premier Marinas are very good at at um, working with us on these sorts of things. We have, as part of a separate and targeted risk assessment, put in place paddleboard signage. Now, uh, many paddleboard um, users are, are not familiar with the rule of the road. They're not. Uh, and, and so helping them understand what is required um, is, is um, <clears throat> a thinking person's game. Uh, working closely with them, we've come up with uh, m something that's more akin to road signage um, terminology, stop, give way, single file, cross here. And those signs have been put up with the help of the outfit up at Premier, and they've been in place for the whole of the summer. Now, in the high, high times of summer, um, paddleboarding is hugely popular. Um, I think the boat show paddle boards were all sold out in advance of the boat show time. Funny enough, they're all appearing on eBay now. Um, so um, paddle boarding is not quite what it was. And also the weather is uh, is not particularly favourable. Nevertheless, come next summer, 
we can, I think, fully expect a, um, a resurgence of activity. And it, yes, it does require um, some activity, but members here will probably know that uh, a select committee 11 years ago looked at a number of classes of vessels, kayaks, um, dinghies and so on, uh, and chose, uh, elected not to charge those craft uh, for use. Now, we revisited that in January last year and found that still to be true. We, we, we didn't want to do that. Uh, I think that's right. Um, in, in reality, um, our presence, patrol boat presence, works up there. Um, but we do overlay what we have to do for paddleboarding with uh, managing some of the other um, events, the speeding perhaps at the mouth of the river, um, the antisocial behaviour that we've heard so much about. So it does collectively, when ev every one of those things takes place simultaneously, uh, there is an additional draw on resources. But we do manage it um, and we've managed it effectively and I've covered the matter off in the course of the first article of my own Marine Director's report, which is the independent review of our safety management system by the independent designated person. And it is his judgment that the risk assessments that we have in place are satisfactory. So I am uh, content, which allows me then to reassure the duty holder um, that we have taken all reasonable steps to reduce the risks for paddle boarding and kayaks um, to levels that are as low as we can be practical. Okay, thank you for that, Jason. Thank you for your question, Mark. Uh, Councillor Roger Huckstack, next, please. Thank you, Sean. Um, an observation uh, which uh, members might like to know. Uh, my wife successfully presided over the prosecution of a jet skier uh, earlier this week. Uh, he had been found guilty of speeding at 10 knots in the Solent. So uh, obviously uh, things are happening in terms of deterring such behaviour. Okay, thank you for that. Well, I guess, was he on, in the Solent or on the Hamble? Or what? It was on the Solent. Yeah. Didn't know there was a speed limit on the Solent. Good prosecution, I say. Right. Okay, and no, didn't see any other questions. And the recommendation is there, a simple one, that we recommend to the River Hamble Harbour Board to approve the fees and charges set out below and advertise them on the River Hamble website. Anybody object? Raise your hand. Anybody wish to abstain? Raise your hand. Otherwise, I'm taking that as agreement. So thank you very much. We now move to the final item, which is the uh, forward plan for future meetings. A uh, very simple one, this one, Appendix 1. This is uh, making the suggestions for items that we would have at the various meetings coming up. So you can see today's meeting there to be followed by the Harbour Board on the 8th of January. Uh, and then proposals for our March meeting and the dates for the next municipal year, which is uh, 2021 stroke 2022. I think we expect to see those circulated shortly, do we not, Emma? Very shortly, yes, Chairman. Thank you very much. So the request there is that the report be noted. Any objections to noting that report? Okay, well that brings us to the end of the calendar years meetings for the River Hamble Harbour Management Committee in the end of a very peculiar year, one of which I hope we will never see the like again. But that said, I would like to wish all members the happiest Christmas that social distancing will allow you all to have and hopefully looking forward to a much pleasanter, healthy new year. So thank you very much and that's the end of the meeting. Thank you, Sean. Thank you.